Please, hello everyone. Um, today's meeting is about uh, primordial lithium problem. It's a, a more or less decade long uh, trouble in cosmology and in, I can say, as particle physicist, I can say also in particle physics. And today we have uh, two talks about the trouble. Uh, so, Brian, please start the first talk. All right. Well, thank you very much, Andy, and uh, and thank you all for for tuning in. Um, so Joseph and I are are here today because we have a problem, and as Andy says, it's a stubborn problem that's been going on for more than ten years, and so that and this is this problem with the uh, with the primordial lithium abundance, um, and so I you see I refer to this as a bitter pill, uh, and it's bad not just for cosmologists but also as you know lithium has many uses. It's in the your computer batteries. It's in psychoactive medication. And as you see the picture here, if because of COVID you're binge watching Breaking Bad, my understanding is lithium is important for the central substance in that show. So, uh, uh, so this is work that uh, I've done uh, with many people, but I wanted to particularly highlight Keith Olive, who many of you probably know, and Sung Han Ye, who's a, a finishing graduate student about to be someone's excellent postdoc. All right, so now, um, all right. So the game plan is uh, uh, where Joseph and I are talking. I will first uh, explain the sort of an overview, how the light elements are made in the early universe and the observations we have uh, to, to test what's going on. Uh, then I'll explain how the cosmic microwave background, not surprisingly, plays a key role here. And thus the lithium problem emerges, this discrepancy between the predicted and observed lithium. And I will, re, uh, will review the conventional, what the problem is, and then the conventional solutions, that is solutions that do not involve new physics. And we'll see that, um, that some are ruled out, some it's hard to say, but nothing is very satisfactory. Uh, and that of course is really interesting because that leads us to Yosef, who will then tell us about solutions that involve new physics. All right, so first things first, how do we make the elements in the early universe? All right, so Big Bang nucleosynthesis is, uh, is a beautiful thing for many reasons. And one of the most beautiful reasons is it is a symphony of the fundamental forces, by which I mean uh, it's, a, it's a fairly unique arena in nature because it's a, it's, a, it's a situation where all four fundamental forces participate and interact with each other. And you can see them here. So gravity, uh, weak, strong, electromagnetic and strong, all are essential to the goings on. And as we go through, you can sort of tick them off uh, on your checklist. Um, and because all four fundamental forces participate, Big Bang nucleosynthesis is also a unique test bed that probes all four fundamental interactions and has, uh, uh, has reach for, uh, for new physics that's going on as well. So, uh, so I will be uh, talking in the context of standard Big Bang nucleosynthesis, setting up Yosef to go beyond this. So let me just remind you what standard Big Bang nucleosynthesis is. Uh, and basically it's uh, doing the most, making the most conventional straightforward assumptions you possibly can. So gravity being described by general relativity, uh, the microphysics are the standard model of particle physics. So three neutrino species that are light, low mass, uh, have left-handed couplings only, and uh, also importantly that they're non-degenerate, which effectively says, you know, comparable uh, lepton and baryon numbers, not a gigantic excess of, of leptons over baryons, um, uh, which is, say, a small chemical potential. Um, then we're in kinetic equilibrium, so the, the nuclei have a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, um, and dark matter and dark energy presumably are present. They're in the universe now, they must have been in the universe then, but are non-interacting and so not, are not important for the show. So the key parameter uh, is the ratio of baryons to photons. Uh, so this is this thing we call eta, um, and, uh, and it's the number ratio of baryons to photons. And these densities of both baryons and photons Absolutely, all of as the universe uh, expands, but the ratio remains fixed or should remain fixed at Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So this is a nice parameter. Um, uh, and uh, uh, in a homogeneous universe, uh, 
the expansion is adiabatic. So once the baryon to photon ratio is fixed at big bang nucleosynthesis, it should be the same uh, for recombination when it's measured by the CMB and the same today. And uh, it's a homework exercise to show that knowing the ratio of baryons to photons, you can then derive from that the baryon density or the baryon density parameter. It's also related to the entropy per baryon. All right, so that's the, that's the vanilla standard Big Bang nucleosynthesis. That is the framework I'll be speaking in. Yosef will go beyond that. All right, good. Ah, and I seem to somehow, it was such a good slide, you get to see it twice, sorry. Let's not do this again. I don't know why it's doing that. Okay, good. So here's the story. So the uh, so the basic the basic drama of Big Bang nucleosynthesis is quite simple. We're just following weak and nuclear reactions in an expanding cooling universe. So the characters in our drama are the first of all the radiation, the relativistic particles. We're deep into the radiation dominated phase of the universe. In fact, Big Bang nucleosynthesis is our earliest reliable probe of the universe where you really should know all the physics. And this is the only probe that's deeply in the radiation era. So the radiation density, energy density dominates over the matter density. And the radiation, the relativistic particles consist of course of photons, but also initially of pairs, where a temper where temperature is so high, the pairs are relativistic, and then the neutrino species, and conventionally there should be three neutrino and antineutrino species. The matter consists of, uh, well, uh, baryons, which at high temperatures are only neutrons and protons, nothing more complex can form, uh, we're above an MeV. Uh, and again, the key parameter is the ratio of baryons to photons, this eta parameter, and that will be actually an output of the calculation, but spoiler alert, the number is going to be of order 10 to the minus 9, which is to say there are about a billion photons, a billion CMB photons for every baryon. But unlike today, where the CMB photons are very, these very low energy things, we're talking about where the CMB photons are gamma rays or MeV gamma rays. All right. So the initial conditions, temperatures are above an MeV, which means times are earlier than about one second. Um, and uh, so the universe is very hot and very dense. And um, importantly, uh, neutrinos are, are tightly coupled. So the neutrinos are interacting with each other and with uh, all of the weakly interacting particles to include the nucleons. And so uh, neutrinos drive conversions between neutrons and protons. So neutrinos can change protons to neutrons and neutrons back to protons in the reactions I've shown here and both the forward and reverse reactions go. And so we've got neutrons changing into protons, protons changing into neutrons. And, uh, and uh, under these circumstances, the ratio of neutrons to protons is driven to an equilibrium that uh, depends only on the temperature. <coughs> and it's very easy to understand what the neutron to proton ratio is, because you can think of <coughs> the neutron to proton system as a, as a two energy, uh, as a two level system the nucleon, the ground state is the proton, the excited state is the neutron, and Mr. Boltzmann would tell you the ratio of neutrons to protons is just given by e to the minus energy difference, which is to say mass difference over kT. And so that means at high temperatures, we have equal numbers of neutrons and protons, and as the universe cools, we successfully have more and more protons per neutron. And that, of course, will determine the nucleosynthesis that follows. And so this, uh, the neutron to proton ratio follows this equilibrium value until the weak interactions freeze out and these interchanges between neutrons and protons stop. The weak freeze out occurs about at a time of uh, one second or a temperature of one MeV. And when I say freeze out, what I mean is the time scale, the mean free time for another neutron to proton conversion becomes longer than the age of the universe at the time, which is about one second. And in cosmology, longer than the age of the universe means forever, and then the reactions are ineffective and they stop. And so then the neutron to proton ratio is pinned at this freeze out value, which is about one seventh. And there'll be a few free neutrons de decays afterwards, but that's a, that's a subdominant effect. It's in the code, but it's a subdominant effect. Then, uh, when the universe cools down to uh, a little under uh, 100 keVs, we're at about three minutes, this is the famous first three minutes, the light elements are born. And I've shown a reaction diagram here in the chart of the nuclides, 
and uh, you don't need to memorize all the reactions except to see they're actually quite few. This is much simpler than say stellar nucleosynthesis. And the key thing to appreciate is as all the light elements go, go through all these two body reactions, it's only dense enough for two body reactions, then the, 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 the flow goes around. But if you notice helium four is special because all other boxes have arrows going in and out. There's a flow in and out, but helium four uh, is, a, is an endpoint. All the flow goes in. Uh, and of course, that's because uh, it's simple nuclear physics. Helium-4 is the most stable light nuclei, light nucleus. So essentially, all available neutrons, those are the scarce thing, all the available neutrons go into helium-4, and that ends up being about 24, 25% by mass. Uh, mostly what's left is just remaining protons, which will be hydrogen today. But because the burning is not, not complete, when the, when the reactions finally freeze out, there are trace amounts of deuterium, helium-3, and lithium-7. That's the basic story, that's it, very simple. And I should mention, so all of these nuclear reactions are measured uh, in the lab at BBN Energy. So again, this is actually better than the circumstances, for example, with the sun, where you have to extrapolate uh, to lower energy than we can measure. All right, so this summarizes the predictions of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. This is the famous SRAM plot, where on the horizontal axis, I'm showing the baryon density, so, or equivalently the baryon to photon ratio of the universe. The, the universe only has one value. It's a homogeneous universe. It has one value for this, but that's the free parameter we don't know. So we run for a range of values and this is the interesting range. The y-axis, I'm showing you abundances and notice the very different scales. Helium-4, this thing YP, it's the mass fraction of helium-4. And you see, no matter what you do, you get around 25% of the baryons are in helium. Then I switch to a log scale and you see deuterium drops dramatically and it's a small fraction of hydrogen. And then you see lithium is down in parts in 10 to the nine, 10 to the 10. Uh, and so uh, the other thing to notice is these curve widths. These are not just to make it easier to see, uh, these are actually the theoretical uncertainties which are completely dominated by the nuclear reaction cross-section uncertainties which have been propagated appropriately. All right, so. That's the theory, and now we want to test this. So we want to go out and observe the light elements. Oh, oh yeah, and you'll notice uh, if you look around the baryon photon ratio of interest, which is where I've drawn the circle, you'll see that lithium is rising, deuterium is dropping. There's a uh, deuterium-lithium anti-correlation. That story will, uh, will continue, and I think Joseph will probably uh, have something to say about that as well. Okay, so... <clears throat> So now, so our theory then is the lightest elements and only the lightest elements are created in the first three minutes. And now we want to go test this. So we want to go and measure the primordial abundances in the cosmos observationally. Um, and it turns out this is a very difficult problem. So it's the usual story about the drunk and the keys. You look under the light post, not because it's the best place to look, but because it's the only place you can look. Uh, so for deuterium, where, and, we, and there's no one place where we can see all the light elements, we just do the best we can with each of them. Deuterium is actually a, a, a success story. Uh, deuterium, we're able to do this very well now. We astronomers can do this very well by looking at distant, uh, uh, we see deuterium in distant galaxies that are backlit by quasars. Um, and so we see deuterium in absorption uh, that, uh, by, of the quasar light as it comes to us. And so we do see deuterium directly at high redshift in low metallicity systems. And now the abundances are, uh, are quoted to better than 1% precision. It's quite impressive. Um, helium-4, we have to measure in a different way. We measure that in ionized gas in metal poor galaxies, very primitive galaxies. And uh, uh, importantly, now the microwave background itself, look at CMB, also provides a measurement of helium-4. I'll have something more to say about that. Uh, Lithium, we'll say much more about lithium, uh, but to preview, it's meddled in the very ancient metal poor halo uh, stars in our own galaxy. And I'll say something about extra galactic observations as well. That's a new thing. Helium-3, the long story short is helium-3, there's no good way to get a reliable primordial abundance. So we don't actually use it for cosmology anymore. All right, so now, after that whirlwind tour, we now have observations, or you, we're taking my word that we have observations of the light elements, and we want to compare to theory. And so, just to remind you, the theory is predicting abundances for helium-4, uh, deuterium, helium-3, lithium-7, and we have observations of three of those things. So the theory is actually overdetermined. So that's interesting. 
And so you could, there's several ways you can imagine playing this. So first, if you had a perfect observation, say, of the helium-4 abundance, you can just read off the baryon to photon ratio. Um, of, co of course, in real life, uh, the actual observation will have some uncertainties. So it's a band uh, vertically, and that corresponds to a band horizontally, a range of baryon to photon ratio. And each, each observation, each different nucleus, each different light element will select its own range of the baryon to photon ratio. <laughs> but the universe is homogeneous, it only has one value. And so we wanna see are the different values consistent with each other. That's what we're looking for, is consistency among the light elements. And again, this is over constrained because we have multiple light elements. If you only had one uh, that you're just measuring the baryon to photon ratio, you have multiple, you're testing the theory. And we do have multiple ones. So now I've shifted the plot a little bit. And uh, so now what I've done is I've drawn yellow boxes to show you the vertical and horizontal range uh, set by each element. So at the top, you see helium. Uh, we measure it to 1%, it's quite good, but we need it to high precision. So you see it carves out quite a wide swath. Uh, that's the horizontal swath in the top box of the helium abundance. Deuterium, it's actually hard to see. That's this blue curve. And where it intersects this vertical line, there's a little yellow band that's very hard for you to even see. And that's the power of deuterium. It's very, very constraining in the, in the baryon to photon ratio, and it makes this sort of purple band. And then you see lithium down here, the observations carve out this swath towards the low end of the baryon to photon ratio. And again, each one is picking out its baryon to photon ratio that that element likes, and we wanna see is their consistency. And what you can see is that helium-4 agrees with deuterium, but it's, it's broad enough it also agrees with lithium, but lithium and deuterium do not agree with each other. So, uh, so we've got this disagreement, and so we need a tiebreaker, all right? So that's where the CMB comes into play. So that's where the tie breaking comes into play. So the cosmic microwave background, I don't need to tell you, is an incredibly powerful tool for all of cosmology and absolutely for Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And that's because the anisotropies in the microwave background, both the temperature and the polarization anisotropies, are sensitive to many cosmological parameters, but they're exquisitely good at measuring the baryon to photon ratio, the baryon density. And there's a whole story in itself how this works, but the idea is in these dark matter uh, gravity potentials in the Euler universe, there's a baryon to photon plasma that's oscillating. And in this baryon to photon plasma, as we add more baryons, their gravity boosts compression, which leads to a rise in the first peak, which is a compression peak. But as the plasma rebounds and expands, the baryon inertia damps the rarefaction peak, which means it pushes down the second and so forth. So the relative peak heights are controlled by the baryon to photon ratio. And as a result, we can do very well in measuring the baryon to photon ratio independently from, from the microwave background. And then we can compare the Big Bang nucleosynthesis value of this and the microwave background and make a fundamental test of cosmology. And so to cut to the chase, here's how this works. The baryon to photon ratio you can get from the, the CMB, the baryon density is very precise. Uh, so in terms of the baryon to photon ratio, omega B, or in terms of the baryon density, omega BH squared, uh, it's better than a percent. Uh, so omega BH squared is about 0.02, so about 4% of the universe is in baryons, and the baryon to photon ratio you see is about 6, 10 to the minus 10. So a little more than a billion uh, photons per baryon, a sub 1% measurement. Uh, so now we've got a new way of testing Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Since you can do so well with the uh, cosmic microwave background, there's another way to play the game use the Planck measurement of the baryon to photon ratio as an input, and then from that, read off, propagate the errors appropriately, and then read off the light elements. And so that's what we're gonna do, and then we'll compare with what the observations tell us. It's just another way of looking at the problem. And so that's what we've done. There's my awesome graduate student, Sung Han Ye, and uh, so here's the deal. So this is what we've done. So for each light element, we did the exercise before, we used the CMB to tell us, CMB plus Big Bang nucleosynthesis theory tells us what our predictions are. Those are these things in sort of purple. Um, and then, so, and these are likelihood functions. So you can see uh, helium-4, deuterium, helium-3, lithium, all the purple curves, those are, uh, are CMB plus Big Bang nucleosynthesis theory. Then the yellow curves are the observations. And so, uh, and these are likelihoods, so we want to see them on top of each other. That says there's agreement. 
And so if you look through, what you see is deuterium is looking great. There's excellent agreement, even better than it has a right to be. So that's awesome. No! Uh, but if you look down at lithium, oh, in helium-4, you see uh, uh, the predictions are actually much more accurate than the observations. That's the first panel, top, uh, top left. And the predictions are much more accurate than the observations, but it's fine. And the little cyan curve is the CMB itself. So all of those are in good agreement. But if you look down at the bottom right, uh, you see the lithium prediction and observation uh, are completely disjoint. They're not touching each other at all. Uh, so the observation is lower than the theory uh, by about a factor of four. It's something like a four to five uh, sigma discrepancy. This is the lithium problem. All right. That is the, the bottom panel. That's the lithium problem. Houston, we have a problem. All right. So uh, in my remaining time, let me say a bit more about this problem, which again is this disjoint uh, distributions between the predicted and observed lithium. All right. Uh, so to understand this problem, uh, the, I, I want to I give you an idea of how serious the problem is and the extent to which we need new physics. And then Yosef will take it away on the new physics. So let me say a little bit more about the observations of lithium, since those are the things that are giving us a problem. So in general, when we want to measure primordial abundances, the sort of problem is our beautiful predictions for the universe at three minutes, that's sort of there and then. I mean, really, the Big Bang is everywhere, but you get the spirit of what I mean. The observations are always taken much later than that. Uh, and, and because we have to make these observations astronomically, stars have turned on. And stars make all the elements other than the light elements. And they also make helium. They destroy uh, deuterium and lithium. They do things to the light element abundances. So the stars are polluters from our point of view. Um, and so the solution to this problem is we can't get away from the fact that we have a universe made with stars. And so we just have to live with it and correct for them. And the key point, as you see here, as we go around this circle of life, gas is made into stars, which die and inject their new elements back into the next generation of stars. Not only do the light elements change as you cycle around, but the stars make heavy elements. So the heavy elements, the metals, as astronomers say, uh, trace how evolved the system is. And so in general, metals go up with time. So if we find systems with low metallicity, small heavy element abundances, those are more primitive, those are closer to the Big Bang. So that's the general strategy. And so with lithium, this is the idea. So we observe lithium where we can, and where we can is in very old, low metallicity stars in our galaxy. So this is kind of an old plot, but it gives you a sense. So I'm plotting horizontally for a bunch of stars. Every dot is a star uh, in which you measure in the atmosphere of the star its, uh, its lithium abundance and its iron abundance. And so horizontal axis is a log scale of the iron abundance showing more than three orders of magnitude. Vertical scale is a log scale showing lithium abundance. And so since metallicity increases with time, heavy elements increase with time, in general, you should read the horizontal axis as some increasing function of time. So the low metallicity points are primitive stars that were born uh, uh, close to the Big Bang, and the high metallicity stars like the sun were born much later in a more polluted environment. And so if you look at the lithium curve, the top curve, the sort of orange points, what you see is as you go back in time, the lithium drops. So that means the galaxy was making some lithium as it was making metals. But as you go to very low metallicity, the lithium abundance doesn't go to zero. Um, and so that says no matter how early you go, before any stars were made, there already was lithium. And that means lithium is primordial. So that's a beautiful thing. This is how we know lithium is primordial. But the question is, is lithium primordial at the level we measure, at the level measured by those stars? And no, the prediction we make is a factor of four above. Why is that? Um, and, uh, and could there be a problem with the observations? <coughs> and the truth is, that's unclear. Um, but there is, a, there is a funny thing that the observations show very little scatter. They're very consistent with the same low value until you get to extremely low metallicities, extremely low iron abundances. And then there's this peculiar effect as we get to very low iron abundances, as you can see going down to almost 10 to the minus four of solar, suddenly the lithium abundances develop this huge scatter that we don't see at higher metallicities. Um, and uh, it's hard to understand what's going on, but it looks like at least some stars are effectively eating their lithium. We're measuring the lithium in the star. Somehow the star has been destroying some of its lithium. So at least some stars know how to do that. But apparently this stops at a metallicity of 10 to the minus 2.5, and we don't really know why. Um, 
And so this is sometimes called the meltdown. Uh, meltdowns are bad. And we don't really know why it turns on. And there's a peculiar thing that, again, the predictions from Big Bang nuclear synthesis are way up here. And we don't see any stars that scatter towards this prediction. And that's peculiar, because if the stars were destroying their lithium, say, by rotating and mixing more, you would expect some to scatter into this lithium desert, but we see nothing. So it's, uh, uh, it's hard to understand what's going on from a stellar evolution point of view. So, that suggests maybe we want to take another approach. When we're measuring lithium in stars, we're doing the best we can, but it's kind of a terrible place because stars are element factories. It's like measuring air quality outside of a factory. That's a terrible idea. What you'd like to do is go to the countryside where there's not pollution. And so the way to do this is to look in the interstellar medium, not in a star itself, but in gas uh, between stars in a low metallicity galaxy. This is very hard to do, but there's a proof of concept looking at the, our nearby neighbor, the large, uh, the small Magellanic Cloud. So that's a this little dwarf galaxy. It's not particularly low metallicity. It's not very primitive, but it's about a quarter solar metallicity. And there's this beautiful spectrum that my observer colleague Chris Hauck took, and you can see gorgeous lithium lines here. Um, and so here's the result from that exercise. So once again, I've now sort of more schematically shown this plot. Again, metallicity is showing you how evolved the system is and then the lithium abundance. And you've got the hashed lines give you a, the idea of where the observations lie if I showed them all. And then there's a theory curve that shows BBN increasing from the predicted value up to the, up to the solar value today. And then this little point in red is this thing that we've measured in the small Magellanic cloud. Um, so and Brian, just a reminder, you have five minutes. Perfect, perfect. Um, and so what, you, so what you see is sort of interesting. So uh, it is a true fact that the SMC level that we measured is at the BBN level. It's literally at the BBN level. So at first, oh, that's great. So it looks like there's not a problem. But like, no, that's the wrong way to look at it. The SMC point is exactly on the trend of how uh, lithium grows with metallicity as measured by the stars. So the thing we measured in this beautiful, pristine interstellar environment agrees with what we were measuring in the stars. So we suggest that the stars are not conspiring to destroy our other lithium, at least not at the metallicities of the SMC. Uh, and so if there is some conspiracy in the stars, it has to turn on right below the metallicity of the, of the SMC. So, if, so that isn't to say stars can't destroy their lithium in a conspiratorial way, but they have to be rather fine tuned for it. And that's the situation. Um, since I've got uh, uh, a little extra moment, let me also say there's, a, there's another way to solve the problem where you say, I believe the observations, the basic BBN theory is right, the standard picture is right, but maybe there's a problem with nuclear physics. I said all the reactions are measured in the lab, but maybe there's some reaction that uh, is normally subdominant, but it has a resonance in it that we missed. Uh, and so uh, 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 Maxime Pospolov and my former student, Rich Seibert, uh, pioneered this by pointing out uh, that uh, the, the beryllium 7 plus D system might have a, uh, has room for a, a resonance which could potentially solve the problem. If you're familiar with Fred Hoyle, it's like Fred Hoyle making carbon 12 through a resonance. Very similar story. And with my student and Keith Olive, we looked through systematically every possible resonance you could have in two-body reactions and proposed a number of resonances to look for. And here's, an, here's how the game is played. You have a resonance energy, you have a strength, and if you get it just right, these contours start to move towards solving the lithium problem. Uh, by boosting lithium destruction. But uh, uh, that, that's the good news. The bad news is, sorry, uh, it's not there. The experiments have now been made and it's not there. So, uh, so we can rule that out, which is actually progress. So the solution is not in nuclear physics. So, <clears throat> so now Andy's getting nervous, so let me finish up. So here's the basic outlook getting ready for Joseph. So we have this the big pictures, we have this beautiful convergence of particle physics and cosmology in this audience. I don't need to emphasize this. And the success of each uh, points to the uh, uh, to, to new physics and new things we can learn. Okay. And there's this beautiful interplay between Big Bang nuclear synthesis and the microwave background. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing too. And if you're not too worried about the lithium problem, there's other stuff we can say about what Big Bang nuclear synthesis tells you about dark matter and so forth. Uh, but we do have this lithium problem. What are we going to do about it? This problem has been with us for quite a long time since the very first WMAP measurements. The basic problem hasn't gone away. It's just all the measurements have gotten better and uh, nothing's moved. Um, and so, as I mentioned, astrophysical solutions are possible, but they're highly constrained. It's, very, it's, it's, it's not trivial to do this. Um, I should mention 
that uh, there is room for new nuclear physics and that, that work is being done. Uh, because it turns out, for example, the deuterium observations are now better than the predictions, which means the nuclear physics needs to catch up with that. And there's ongoing work on that. And so finally, but it really looks like it's at least worth considering new physics to solve the lithium problem. And that's what Joseph will tell you in a few seconds. Uh, so in the future, there's going to be even better CMB measurements. This is famous stage four. Uh, and that will even further pin down what's going on and get better helium abundances, which will be interesting. Um, and uh, there are prospects for better light element measurements and, uh, uh, and uh, stellar work. Um, and there continues to be this beautiful interplay between uh, um, uh, nuclear physics, uh, accelerator physics, and dark matter. And so with that, I will uh, thank you for your, uh, for your time and attention. So any questions? Uh, yes, I'd like to ask a question, if I may. Uh, it's Philip Mannheim. Um, if you go and ask, can we make more lithium after the Big Bang through stellar reprocessing, won't that also change the deuterium prediction if deuterium could also be made that way that's the first question the second question is if the cmb number for lithium is it high enough that it could have been seen in heise quasar absorbers and are we ah. close to that point yeah because that's that right. would be a totally independent check of the cmb prediction yeah yeah so that's that's very good so uh uh so, so like, so let me let me let me try to take them one by one. So the first thing, what about stellar production of lithium? Uh, so the the uh, the thing to so so that's a that's a great idea. So both both are great ideas, and both there's a, there are many papers on exactly your question. So in terms of stellar production, one thing to to recall. Um, just to make sure everybody's on the same page that remember the observations are below the prediction and these observations are in you know low metallicity stars in our galaxy but they still you know there's they're they're low metallicity and old but they still you know are probably were around a billion years after the big bang so if there's early production of lithium that only adds to what should be in the stars which means the primordial abundance is even lower so stellar production actually makes it worse but you could have stellar destruction of lithium. It's the same idea though, but just go, go the other way. Stars, most stars are net destroyers of lithium. Um, and so if you had big generations of stars that processed a bunch of uh, baryons, then they could destroy lithium. And then, uh, uh, and then that's why you'd be seeing lower than the prediction because you actually processed a bunch of this stuff. The thing is, it's very hard to process a large fraction of baryons through stars and not know it in some other way. Stars make a big mess. And so you'd see a bunch of heavy elements, you'd see carbon, and as you say, you would see the destruction of deuterium, which is even more fragile than lithium. So, uh, so that's, uh, so th there's more, more you can say, but maybe I'll, I'll leave it with that on the stellar side. But that, that's, a, that's a super interesting point that people looked at. Um, the other question is seeing lithium in high redshift, and that is a great idea. That, in fact, is exactly the equivalent of what we've done in the SMC for low metallicity, and we would love to do that for high redshift. It turns out to be very, very difficult to do um, because this line is uh, the the because the lithium abundance is so small. Uh, the line is hard to find, and uh, and it, you have to not get it confused with hydrogen. And it's it's uh, it's hard work to do this, but that's that's basically exactly what we would like to do. So that's that's one of the forefronts is to is to make that happen. And but it's observationally, it's a very challenging problem, which is why it hasn't been done yet. But that's that's exactly what we would like to do, because then we'd be measuring lithium essentially the same way we measure deuterium, which is the, the right way to do it. That's exactly right. So any more questions? Yes. Uh, can I ask a question? Probably maybe. Uh, I mean, excuse me if I. <laughs> missed something but if i understand correctly now to formulate this lithium problem you do not use astronomical observations of helium is it correct you only use the uh data from cmb and uh, predictions of standard model bbn is it correct well no no so we we do use in fact the the little bottom panel shows us the top left panel the the observations of this helium and the little needle the purple needle is the theory and the yellow is the observations of helium those are astronomical observations of helium the cmb is the cyan 
okay, which value for astronomical helium do you use and which error bars? Can you can you just uh... oh uh, let's see uh, and I, I won't be able to get the slide quick enough to, so it's uh, this is using the the most recent work from uh, uh, Olive Skillman and Ava. Um. Yeah, just if you look at the papers, there are uh, I think four or five groups, and there is a first work by Izotov and others, and then other groups are doing exactly the same. The only difference is that they make different assumptions. And they use galaxies with which are higher <coughs> metallicity. So this is not independent analysis. It's the same analysis just applied to a bit different data and not better quality data. So what I'm trying to say is that the difference between Izotov and later works is quite significant. Izotov gives 0 0.2457, and those guys give uh, zero twenty four five some uh, some I mean I don't remember numbers right now but the difference is quite significant and I I I, I discussed this with Izotov and he believes that uh, because other people apply the the same approach but to different data which are higher <coughs> metallicity he really believes that the real systematic error is the difference between his value and their value. So this is the, you know, so, so, so to say is a measure of uncertainty. And I, if I, I mean, you were very quick because of the lack of time, but if I understand correctly, if we apply this error bars as Isotov advocates as systematics, this would relax the problem a little bit. Well, so yeah, as you say, this is a whole talk in itself. But the so so it is true. So that in, for for everyone else, for the the non-experts. So indeed, there these these helium measurements involve these uh, these low metallicity dwarf galaxies nearby, and uh, there there are two groups looking at the at really the, in fact the very same galaxies and even looking at the same data. But they but this this gives you an idea of the systematics. We are seeing a bunch of emission lines, atomic lines. And then you need to translate that into abundances, and you need to know something about the thermodynamic conditions to properly do the radiation transfer. And uh, and they have different ways of doing this, and they get somewhat different results. And uh, uh, and so and indeed, the systematics are the most important thing. And all the papers of late uh, from both groups are really about addressing the systematics. And so. I'll just maybe leave it at that, except to say that the good news is as the microwave background becomes measure at me better at measuring helium-4, then in the end, we can do this with the microwave background, which is a very clean measurement, which then does avoid some of these astrophysical uncertainties. Um, so uh, maybe in, the, in view of the time, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, uh, I think time is flying. So uh, Brian, thank you. It was very nice talk and uh,